work at a school and uh oh we live okay never mind. <laughs> i was gonna watch another story hey <laughs> crazy okay um so welcome everybody to another episode of love language the round table um hope everybody's having a good day i feel good i pray that everybody is um uh staying healthy apparently there's cooties floating around the atmosphere so uh you know wash your hands people take your vitamins no um but yeah but i pray everybody uh, uh is having a good day having a good weekend and if you celebrate the sabbath happy sabbath y'all so we are talking about learning how to love today so that's the title and um uh, this I'm, I'm I'm really excited about the topic. Me and Shema was just talking before the hand, so I'm curious to see what he got to say about it. But uh, the detail says, oh, before we get to that, I do this every single week. So if you're online, if you're watching this live on Facebook and you want to join the panel uh, and say a few words, there's a Zoom link that you can click on in the details portion of the event, and you can join and uh, and talk with us live. If you want to put your comments in the comment section, will be over there as well managing comments and share the video of course uh you know it'll be almost a year for us on this platform so we hope and pray that everything that we have presented as far as topics has been um uh encouraging you know what i'm saying even if it's just start the conversation in your households amongst your friends and family that's ultimately the goal of this it's not just for us to talk amongst ourselves although i think we all can say we learned a great deal from it but we hope that the messages are spread as broadly as possible and that the most high ultimately be pleased with the information and that he be more pleased in seeing it take root in our lives and that we are better because of it. So that's my little thing about that. So the details of today's um, topic says love is a construct that love is a construct, excuse me, that many profess to understand. But how are we sure that we know how to love? Is there a standard for love? Why or why not? Is it possible to love your partner too much? How do you balance your understanding of love with what your partner thinks is love? So again, those are some of the initial questions. And uh, uh, oh, if you have other questions or other thoughts about it, we can freestyle it. Like it's always, a, it's always room open for that as well. So, um, so as far as order, Shama Shamika, and I'll go last. Yes, no, maybe so. Yes, that's what it is. Open and comment. Yep. Um, again, hopefully, uh, Chief Jeb will be here soon. Uh, he just getting over a flu as well uh, over the past uh, week. It's been tough for him. But um, let me know if y'all can hear me. So I'm guessing I'm going first, right? So this is just an opening. Just an opening. Um, like we were saying right before the show started, I think that uh, love is is according to perception or perspective perspective um as far as when dealing with um individuals uh, within the uh, social construct of all of us now when you're dealing with different um, i guess cultures or faiths or religions then that's a different um it's a different topic you know, because these different religions and cultures have a certain um, outlook on what they uh, believe love to be. So when I touch on some of these questions, um, I'm going to try to go on both sides because uh, those of us that uh, deal with the culture of the, uh, the Hebrews or the Bene uh, Yisrael, the children of um, Israel, then we kind of have an outlook on love according to the literature. Do we always operate within it? No. And that's evident uh, through all the narratives uh, uh, within the Tanakh. That's, that's shown, but it still is there. Uh, it's great examples, and hopefully I can bring it out uh, properly and in a way that could really uh, provoke thought to those of you because it definitely provoked thought to me when I looked over it. So with that, I yield. Okay. Um, I pretty much agree with what Shema said, um, but I'm 
interested throughout the conversation to see how um, the views from like our biblical views of love and our quote unquote perspectives of love correlate. Because I think, um, well, the way I learned at first what love is, is completely wrong from the way I know it now. So yeah, um, I'm just, I'm just interested to hear y'all's thoughts. Yeah, I think that uh, I think the the topic is is complex because of um, the English language, you know, and um, also um, you know the information that we get from a lot of different sources about what love looks like. You know what I'm saying? So I think that. Um, you know, I wouldn't, well, we'll get into it, but yeah, so I, so I guess my open thoughts is that I don't think it's simple. I think it's com complicated, but I think it's only a complicated because uh, of the messages that we get. But I think it's very simple, which I'm sure you might going to get into, especially we, for those of us who follow Torah and, and, and believe that that's the, the, the framework in which we ought to live, then I think it's a lot simpler, um, but the messages often uh, confuse things, which is actually, uh, interesting because I think next week's topic is going to talk about um, the messages that we get from other mediums. So anyway, so the first question is: um, Is there a standard for love? Why or why not? And I'll put it in the the Zoom thing as well. Is there a standard for love? Why or why not? All right. So I'm going to start off with uh, the worldly view of it. Um, I believe that there is not a standard for love um, when dealing with just the world. Uh, some people have different um, ideas of how to be love. Um, perfect example is people that um, are okay with certain things being said to them and about them when in the relationship. And then it's others that are not okay uh, with that same um, that same delivery. Like so, perfect example. I'm one that won't even. I don't even like my uh, male friends to call me the word nigga. Um, from my point of view, that is not um, love because that was not. Um, put out there in love. I know we we took it, made it a positive, people say, but that's just not how I operate. And those that know me understand that. But some of them and others are okay with that. So that's just a different perspective, right? Um, but I think depending on uh, the situations that we do have a universal idea of love, and I guess that can be respect. But even respect is perspective. Hence the example I just used. So I think that there is really no standard of love in uh, the, this culture that we call the U.S. corporation in the United States. It's just a, a melting pot of different ideas and um, thoughts that pertaining to what love is. Now, in regards to... Um, the Hebrew culture, according to the literature, I believe it is a standard uh, for love. Um, and if I have enough time, I can go through a couple things. I want to make sure that this, what I'm going to bring out is not overlapping some of the other questions. Um, well, might okay. So I'm going to use one example. And that one example is how the Most High wants us to love him. And he always stresses to be holy as I am holy. You know, be he set apart, be kadosh. He wants us to be the same way towards him and also towards our neighbors, which some of you are familiar with from Leviticus. And I'm not going to go into all that, but I'm going to go to this specific uh, scripture real quick. Give me a second. Where is it? Okay, so Debarim chapter 6. A lot of y'all already know this. 
4 through 7. And it says, Hear, O Yisrael, uh, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. It says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. I'm going to stop there. Y'all can read the rest for yourselves. Is one thing I want to pinpoint out of those three things that he mentioned. He said, your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. The first two can be, it can be according to your own perspective. That's what I will say. But it's no way to get around a third one. I'm going to tell you why. Say if you're lifting weights and you're coming um, on to your last rep, and you struggling. You, if you don't push it, that weight is gonna fall on your neck or whatever. You know, if you lay it down, so you gotta push with all your strength. There's no giving up. There's no excuses. You have no room for it. You literally have to go, and you gotta push in every aspect in order to accomplish that rep, so that you won't harm yourself. So, the reason I love that third part that he mentioned was because I can relate that to uh, lifting weights. I can relate that um, to sports with an individual, uh, to someone that's on death row, that's trying to figure out a way not to be on death row. Why am I using that as an example? Because they're going to go with all their strength, all their being to accomplish surviving to accomplish, um, you know, winning, to accomplish uh, all of those things. So I think that is a perfect example of uh, how you are should, you, to love other people. You know what I'm saying? You're doing everything possible um, to, um, to uh, show that and to live it. So with that, I'll just stop right there. And I'll save my other examples for uh, the next questions. Okay, so I don't know if I'm about to word this correctly, but I believe there is a standard with love, but somebody told me when you say, but you cancel out everything you said before. But uh, so. I would say it's a standard to love, but I think we we have to use wisdom and we have to be careful because um, we taught and we read the, you know, we, we taught to love somebody unconditionally, love everybody unconditionally, no matter what you show everybody love, you love everybody. Like you said, with all your heart, with all your strength, you, you love people, but you have to be careful of the people um, you give that to. Say, for instance, you're in a marriage or a relationship, whatever, and the person is abusive. Do you sit there and love that person unconditionally? Because then where's your self-love? Where's your protection and love for yourself? So I think it's a... I don't know. I just think you got to use wisdom because... I I feel like this. I I give an example of a family member of mine. It's a family member of mine who has, you know, the scripture to say, and I'm paraphrasing, you know, forgive your brother 77 times, you know, over or whatever. This person has wronged and wronged and wronged me, and I've forgiven this person, but I have not, but this person hasn't changed their actions. So it's a constant thing. So do I do I continue to push out all this love and give it to this person and let them, even though they haven't changed, even though I forgave them, do I continue to put myself in this position to get hurt by this person? Or do I separate myself, still have love for this person? If you need me, I got you. If you're hungry, if something happened, then I can be there for you because I still love you, but I can't... Um, Y'all help me out. I don't know if I'm saying this right. If y'all get what I'm saying, do y'all get what I'm saying? Or am I making sense? Like, you have to, I just said use wisdom. I think it's a standard. 
you love people and you be there for people, but you don't necessarily have to um, surround yourself all the time with people because not everybody um, deserves that. Like, I don't know how to say it, y'all. I don't know how to say it, but yeah, I'm just going to yield because I don't know if I'm articulating this correctly. No, you're good. Don't, um, don't shush yourself. We feel you. We understand. Your voice is good. So did you want to continue your thought or are you good? No, yeah, I'm good. I, I went to the next question. Oh, it's cool. You did a good job. So, because actually what you said made me think a little harder, too. So, uh, so I know Isaiah's putting the, the definition of the word, um, the English word, the English definition of the word love, and then hear what you say. And I think that's, so again, the question is, um, is there a standard for love? Why or why not? And I think that uh, the first thing would be to even identify what is love. And I know that um, the way that people express it can be different. And so in that respect, I guess you, there is no air quote standard, but I think that love, we would have to at least agree that it's a verb, right? So a lot of, um, so even the definition that he put up there, it's like a lot of, you know, this is how I feel. Like I, and people say all the time, I love you. But then when it comes to actions, you don't see nothing. So, um, and I think that we can figure that out without even going into he, to Hebrew. <laughs> There's a disconnect between what we say and what we do. And uh, I gave this example last week, right, as far as the contracts. If you, if I go to get a car and I say, oh, let's, I'm going to CarMax, shop at CarMax. I'm at CarMax, I'm looking around, I'm like, oh, I like this car, I like that car, right? And then I go and I select the car that I want. Then I go into the building and run my credit and they say, yeah, you're good enough, right? And I'm getting ready to sign a contract that says, I like this car so much that I'm going to pay this amount on it every single month, right? And so there's an initial agreement that in order to get what I said I liked or that I love, that there's, a, there's an interaction that has to happen. And that may not even be a good example, but that's kind of how I look at it. Um, I think that uh, until we figure out what love is, um, it's going to always be a confusing situation. Like you said, Shamika, with your examples, you know, I would never tell a person, whether male or female, if you're in a situation that's domestic violence, to stay, because that's stupid. But in a lot of air quote Christian churches, um, or even in some of the religious faiths, um, they tell you to stick it out. You know what I'm saying? They say, oh, no, 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 you got to stick it out. No, you know, good. And then they, a lot of times people will guilt you into it. You know what I'm saying? Oh, your partner might guilt you into it. Like, I thought you loved me. You know, so all types of weird stuff. So there's obviously something wrong because we can, I think a lot of times we know things don't make sense, but we rationalize it, you know what I'm saying? As opposed to going and figuring out what it is and then letting the truth be the thing that leads us. We try to make stuff fit that don't that don't fit and that's not right. Um, also, I think that, uh, Shamika, you mentioned the idea of self-love and that's key. I feel like whatever your standard of love is, it has to, it has to be how you love yourself. And so that's a good marker um, uh, for, you know, for, when you, for if you're interested in, in, a, in a relationship with somebody and you want to pursue that route, watch how they take care of themselves. If they don't wash their booty, if they don't put on deodorant, if they're depressed all the time, if they are extra angry, like that's who they are. And so how can they possibly show you or give you anything uh, if that's where they are within themselves. You know what I'm saying? If they don't take care of themselves, if they don't, you know, manage their credit or manage their, you know, finances properly. So I think a lot of times we look at, and then often, uh, you know, we look at the idea of self-love, again, in, in the context of a, um, I hate to use the word religious, but I don't know how to explain it, but in a religious context, we look at the idea of self-love as being selfish. And we're all selfish at some point. Everybody on this panel, Everybody in this world is selfish. That's a fact. Um, because we're in our own heads having our own experience. And so we are always thinking from our perspective. But there is nothing wrong with loving yourself, right? And, and loving yourself, again, once we figure out what that word means, because I, I agree with Shema, if you look in the scriptures, especially in the Torah, it even tells you how to love yourself. So I think that um, the problem is not whether or not there's a standard for love. The problem is what is love? And then that'll help to define truth and what the standard is, at least from a biblical standpoint. So Shema, I'm not sure. I don't want to throw you into it, but I kind of wanted you to bring out, if you don't mind, the, uh, your understanding about the word love in the scriptures, just to provide some balance in this conversation. So. Uh, 
My bad, my bad. So we're not going to the next question yet. You want me to go a little deeper? Yeah, please. I, I, I'm not even sure we're going to even. I don't know if it's even in the next question. I'm just kidding. Is it in the next question? Come on. I want to uh, say I was playing with Shamika when I had said uh, she asked her the next question, which she did, but it's good. Um, I, I think the, um, and we're going to go into that. We're going to go into the whole thing with like the different variables because y'all know I'm a variable guy, but just like sticking to like what it, what you're asking, like um, you said how we're sure that we know how to love. Is there a standard of love? So what are some definitions? Let's go to, I want to bring some examples out real quick. I want to bring some examples out. Now, I want to say that you can attach this to the whether it's a relationship and even when, with, when it's um, um, friends. I know they're two different subjects, but the, the whole standard within it is simply, it's still the same, you know. Um, so when you go to Genesis 2.24, we know that it's talking about the wife. When it says that the two became one flesh, right? Um, and the flesh being uh, basar, which is actually also meat. That's interesting, right? In Hebrew, basar is meat. But um, it's one flesh. So then when you go to... M-E-E-T, not M-E-A-T, right? Wait, wait, wait. No, 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 meat, like M-A-T. Oh, mates, I got you. My bad. No, no, meat. M E A T. Oh, yeah. oh, okay. I, I want to make sure I wasn't tripping. That, that's what you meant. Oh, my bad. Yeah. The that's word for weird. meat is it's a little weird. Basar. And the word for flesh in um, Genesis 2 24 is le basar. Le basar. So I thought that was pretty interesting because it's telling us to be one flesh. And that's actually the same thing for meat. So one body, that's what it's basically telling us to be. So when you go to, let's go to, um, when you go to 1 Samuel chapter 20, verse 17, uh, this is basically talking about two friends. Uh, Y'all know the story, David and Jonathan, or Dawid and Yohanathan. Um, and it literally says, um, basically says that um where am I at? That he so toki habat napso a it's basically saying that he um that David loved him as his own flesh, his own soul, his own body. Um and then some of you all will reference like the the Bli in the New Testament when it says to love, to love yourself. So it's all pointing on how to actually love someone. How would you treat them? You know, would you treat you gotta treat them like you will treat yourself? We talk about being selfish, like you said, being selfish, then that selfish should transfer over to the other person. That's the that that is a universal understanding. That's that universal standard. Now what um, Shamika was speaking on, which I'm sure we're going to go into, into, into the next question. Um, so I'm going to stay on going to what you wanted me to go to. But like when you go to the actual word Ahava and, and you go into like the uh, interlinear value or the, con, the um, accordance value, it says that it's to desire to breathe after. It's speaking on um let me see it's kind of like to love is to almost it's the same sense of wanting to breathe that's kind of extreme that's, that's some hot bars boy hot, yeah hot it, bars. it's kind of extreme and some can you look at the negative within that but if we're literally talking about just the standard and the definition within the text and how the most high according to the literature and the people that wrote it wants us to love one another that is a um, that is what they wanted you to vision they wanted you to vision that hey 
you are to love the most high and to love your wife and to love your brothers as though you are, are gasping for your last breath, like wanting to breathe. Today, we can't understand that. And I think that's more so dealing with the culture that we're in. I really believe that to be the case uh, because with, with culture comes structure and certain teachings and values. And since there's so much mixture within values today, I believe that's why there's so many different perspectives, uh, which perspectives is good, you know, I'm not knocking it, but it's some unhealthy ones out there too. And that's what kind of formulated a lot of our thinking. So the definition I wanted to give was just, Hava is just basically, um, it goes back to um, the Deuteronomy 6, 4, and five, that's like the most, the, the, the best definition you could possibly have. And it kind of goes with the whole, um, the example of, um, of uh, First Samuel 20. Another one I want to bring out is when you look at uh, Israel or Jacob, um, how he was when dealing with his son. It said that he, and this is a perfect example, but some might find fault in it that he loved him more than all his other sons. And that was due to the, the old age, having him in the old age. But the way that he reacted towards his death is kind of in alignment of the type of love and the, uh, that we should demonstrate and display. And that's just an ideal example. You know what I'm saying? Of course, it's the other variables to your next questions you're about to ask that we're going to go into and we're going to touch on those. But that's basically uh, what it is what the standard should be. That's the ideal thing. And we can accomplish it. And there is people out there doing it, by the way. We just don't see it on a large scale because as I always say, it's only a remnant. And whatever religion you're a part of, it's only always only a remnant that's truly uh, living out what they believe their deity or their literature is telling them to do. So that's my little extra stuff. No, I appreciate that. I was, um, I know we was talking about the Most High, and uh, no, we're, early, we, we're in First Samuel now, so we, we read in First Samuel, and uh, there's a verse that I thought, I'm going to read it real quick, because it's, it's similar, it's on the same path as what you're talking about, um, but this First Samuel 7 and uh, 3, so the, con the construct, this is after the, uh, the hemorrhoid situation um, <laughs> with the Ark and the Covenant, and Israel is basically getting their butt kicked by the Philistines, they can't they can't win for nothing. So uh, this is what Samuel tells them, uh, verse 3, 1 Samuel 7 and 3 says, And Samuel spake unto all the house of Israel, saying, If ye do return unto the Lord with all your hearts, then put away the strange gods and ask to from among you, and prepare your hearts unto the Lord, and you, sorry, what? And serve him only, I'm sorry, and he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. So uh, I know we talk about the most how you read Deuteronomy um, 6, right? Four through seven, yes. So, um, so yeah. So that's an ex So I just oh, and, and you and you. I learned this from you, Shamal. Like with the whole when when we interviewed you the first time many moons ago, and you talked about um, how the Most High showed us what love looks like. Um, and I think He does that. Like He shows us if we have a ear to hear and we can pay attention. He shows us how how we all uh, not only love Him but love each other. And I think that even if you just go off of how he wants to be loved and keep it there, that's enough. Even in the creation story, he prepared everything for us. And then he's put us here and was like, okay, handle it. You know what I'm saying? But he's a provider. He is, he's like always, and Isaiah talked about that. He has his hands stretched out to us. Um, so it's a give and take situation. I think if, if we can just look at that. Whatever you think love is, like you said, Shema, which I thought was beautiful and, and complex, I, I would love to learn more about uh, like that whole, like, love them enough to breathe because I'm thinking about you know stuff like uh <laughs> this is a bad example but the, the show uh, uh the show you on Netflix is an extreme version of that but um <laughs> but I do understand but I do understand how this actually goes to the next question uh as well but um but it is a definitely a, a give and take situation and and it's based off of something so I, I guess I would only say that that we shouldn't be comfortable with just I like you I love you. That shouldn't be good enough. So, um, all right. So the next question is, is it possible to love your partner too much? Is it possible to love your partner too much? Uh, 
Um, I believe that's, um, that depends on the individual, that's perspective. Um, if Shaul was on the, on the show, oh, there you go. I just spoke him up. <laughs> wow. You know what I'm saying, man? I'm a prophet, man. I'm just saying. Yeah. Play. Play. <laughs> I literally just said his name. He popped up. That's crazy. Um, so hold on. Uh, it, that just threw me off. Is it possible to love your partner too much? So like I was about to say, if uh, Shaul was on the show, which he is, I believe he would say uh, yes to that. Uh, and I actually can, I have a, I'm, 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 I'm on, I'm on a fence. I'm both, I, I agree with his statement completely, but I, in addition to it, I have a different side on it as well. Um, but I think it's a positive to it and then it's a negative. And the way that he brings it out is the negative to it, which is a, a good point. Some people love their partner so much that it can cause them not to operate um, the way that the Most High uh, wants them to operate. They lose themselves. Uh, they lose their uh, their focus. They lose what it is that they work towards or what they're working towards. Um, so I believe it has to be a balance uh, with the um, <coughs> with the. Most high being the pinnacle of all of that, uh, you know, and I'm, I don't want to take his shine, but I love the fact that he said that you should only be in love with one being, and that's the most high. Because when you're in love with someone else or in love, even in love with your children, but you got to understand what he means when he say that, by the way, it can cause you, people kill themselves because of being in love. People kill themselves because of being um, in love. And this is his words, I'm by with something that is uh, temporary. You know, life is temporary. We are temporary, our children are temporary. You know, this was some wisdom behind what he said, um, but the most high is everlasting. So uh, we should be in love with him. Hence the first uh, commandment, you know. But, not but, in addition, since Shamika said, but kind of removes everything, and I agree with that. In addition to the wisdom that uh, he put out there, I want to add that. Um, I want to add that not necessarily at the same time. You know, with the examples I brought brought out. Uh, now, now that I think about it, he makes perfect sense. Think of Jacob. Look how Jacob was when he found out that his son, what he thought his son was dead, how he started to be, how it started to kill him. So now that I think about it, man, the man, Shaul, might be on point with that one. Just look at that story, look at that narrative. So is it possible to love your partner too much? I had to change myself and, and say, and say, yeah, I think it is possible to love them too much, but I think it should be a balance. I think that the most has to be the, the, the top priority of everything and anything. And um, we should look at each other, like I said on previous shows, as divine beings, not from a mystical standpoint, but from a standpoint of like, okay, when well, we're dealing with each other in a, in a situation to where it's, um, it could be negative, it can be harsh, it could be, we should look at, when we see each other, we should see the most high. So how about we talk to you the most high? So in that sense, I will add that it has, I, I want to say no, but I, that will be going against what he brought out, which is a perfect example with the Jacob and the Joseph and all that stuff. So um, yeah, it, it's, it's possible to love your partner too much. It's possible. Um, and a lot of us went through it, we go, we go through it now. Um, because when you when you learn not to love them uh, in this sense of this uh, question, then I think you could focus more. I think you could focus more. I think you could focus more. Focus more on the family, uh, the things you have to get done with the with the family, the things you have to get done uh, for the most high, the things that you have to get done for things that you plan to to succeed in. 
uh, holding your ground, uh, standing firm on what you need uh, to do that. So with that, I yield. I think that, that's it. That's it. That's it. I don't want to take too much and say the same stuff. So I agree with his. Hopefully you all heard the thing I said or what he brought about in love with. And I'm ho hopefully he cool with me bringing that out. I don't know if he cool or not with that, but I think that was something that needed to be shared. And with that, I you. Okay, yeah, so I agree 100%, uh, or I'm gonna say 98% <laughs> with Shamai, um, because that, that was what I was kind of getting at, like um, the most high should be number one. And if you love in the most high with all your heart, all your strength, then you can't love your partner um, too much. You you loving him just enough. Because then if you follow in the most high, you following um, the order in the way the most high told you to love him. So then you can't do it too much. But I, I think that you absolutely can love your husband too much or your partner, husband, wife, too much, which is why shows like Fatal Attraction exist. Because you love a person so much that you cannot see them with anybody else. That is bananas to me. So, I, and I think it's perception too. Like, I think it's the way the person perceives love. Like, if you perceive love as this euphoric feeling, then you're going to forever chase that feeling. And if you feel like you have that, then it's not going to go away. You're not going to want it to go away. But if you perceive love in a way it's supposed to be, which is an action, then I'm me cooking, cleaning, and doing what I'm supposed to do, the actions that I'm supposed to do as a wife and loving this man, to me, that's showing him an abundance of love, but not really loving him too much. If you if you know what I'm saying, like I'm not I'm not searching for that or I'm not looking for that like euphoric type feeling. I want my actions to show my love. And I think if your actions show your love, I'm not saying you can't be lovey dovey, kissy kissy and stuff like that, but I think the um people holding on to that too much and that kind of euphoricness is what drives your mind crazy and make you feel like um, life is nothing without this person. Or I can't do life without this person, which is why people end up, unfortunately, committing suicide or, or killing the next person because they cannot envision that level of like uh, love, them giving it to somebody else. So I think if we, you know, except we, we can appreciate the, the love languages as far as like the you know, the loving stuff, the giffy stuff and stuff like that. But I think we got to focus on the action of it. But yeah, I definitely agree that um, you can love somebody entirely too much. I know people who said they love the most high. I saw sisters lead in classes, studying their hearts out. But the man who brought them into knowing the most high, learning about the most high, broke their hearts. And because of that, they turned their backs on everything, including the most high. They went completely off track. And I'm sitting there like, but you just was teaching me last month that the most high was your sun, moon, and stars. But because this human flesh is a liar and deceived you, now you blaming the most high. If you can blame anything that a man do on the most high, you are loving him entirely too much. You putting too much power in his hands. But I think I'm going off at this point, so I, I'm a year. No, that needs to be posted. You need to wrap that up and then put that on Facebook so I could share it. Or I might just quote it myself and put you put it on Facebook. That needs to be heard because I've seen that plenty of times. That's good stuff right there. That's awesome. good stuff. But I'm a year, y'all. Yeah, those are all good points. And um uh, what's the question again? I'm sorry. Uh, oh, is it possible to love? What? Is it possible to love your partner too much? Yep. And um, just some of the things that was said. Uh, I think with Shamal, you was talking. Uh, I don't know. Maybe I don't know who was saying it, but I was thinking about the concept of losing yourself. 
in exchange for gaining another. And I think that, um, uh, oh, with the, with the idea of loving somebody too much, right? You could possibly, right, that's what it was. You, you could lose who you are uh, at the, at, at, in order to try to get somebody. And I can say, I'm just saying, that's, my, that's been my situation, right? And where I have always been a boy chaser, you know what I'm saying? And then, uh, but not being my authentic self, you know what I'm saying? And I think now, it's been happening, but now I'm to the point now where I'm like, this is who I am. And, um, and it can't be no more. And, it, and it's, it's a bit of, it's deceptive to, to then, just to your, just to, 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 I guess, to the points of, um, you know, trying to be something for somebody, you know, in the hopes that they don't leave and all the other stuff. But it's just, you have to be who you are, you know what I'm saying? And you should never be a, a smaller version of yourself in order to be with somebody. You know what I'm saying? You should be who you are. And I think that if you are who you are in all this raggedness or whatever, then uh, whatever you all build from that is, uh, you know, it's at least going to be authentic. So anyway, that's what I want to say about that. Um, also, you know, looking at the most high and, and making him first, again, that's something that I learned too, is um, first of all, he's only being that's even worth it. Right. We look at the look at our history. We look at the our own personal testimonies in our own lives. He is he is consistently there, even in our bull crap, even before we even knew him. I, you know, if I look back at my life and hindsight is always beautiful. You look back at your life. He was there in the midst of a lot of foolishness trying to get my attention. You know what I'm saying? So. Um, but so so that so so he's worthy. He's worthy of that kind of love and anything that will flow from him is uh you know um uh still from him like he's the source of, of all of it so to put anybody above that would be would be odd you know what i'm saying like i think the new testament talks about it uh worshiping the, the creature more than the creator you know it's a similar concept um and then also again going back to the source knowing that uh you know where your peace comes from and our peace is not in anybody else like shema you mentioned like your kids, or it, it, even in death, you can think about death, right? Which is where we're all headed, you know what I'm saying? Death can separate and sever the love of our lives from, our, from us. And so, like you mentioned with Jacob, you know, and, and what was even more interesting about Jacob is that not only was that his, the son of his old age, but that was with the woman that he really liked better than the other one, you know what I'm saying? So it's a lot of other stuff going on in that story. And he was heartbroken, and um, even with, um, um, Ruth, not Ruth, but uh, Naomi, you know what I'm saying, when she, which was a horrible situation, she lost her, all her kids, you know, you know what I'm saying, and her husband, and when she got back, you know, when her and Ruth got back to the, to um, their city, you know what I'm saying, everybody's like, oh, what's up, Naomi, and she's like, don't call me Naomi, call me Mara, because the most has dealt with me bitterly, so it's a hard thing to feel when you, when you have the attachment to other people, and it's not that you don't have attachment, because I think there's a balance in everything, you know, life is, uh, um, a situation of, of, of uh, that, that's complex, but it's also a balance. So if you have somebody or people in your life, I don't say because I think you, you can also love multiple people, not in no freaky dicky thing, but in like a, you know, people around you, uh, you bad with for different reasons. You know what I'm saying? But to put that all on one person is just not appropriate because they and, and the burden it shouldn't be for them to give you everything that you need. They're not God. They can't do it. It's not their responsibility, and they can't do it. Um, so, uh, oh, and then the last thing I'm going to say, I'm kind of ranting, but the last thing I want to say is that, uh, Shemika was talking about the whole lovey-dovey sentiment, you know, that people do look at love as being something where you're constantly, you know, bringing flowers home or doing stuff, which that's cool, but I think ultimately, going back to the original question, the actions will naturally lead to that. So, like with Shemika, if she's in her house doing her wifely duties, which you know, people say wifely duties is sex, but she's just serving her family and loving her family, her husband should find her attractive in her actions, not because she got a big booty or whatever, it's because she is showing the entire household her love for them, and then they should be reciprocated. So um, that's my thoughts, and I know some people, other people have, oh, and so that's all I want to say about that, but show you up next. Hey, for Shaul, um, maybe he can go do the same thing that we're going to do with um, Chief Zeb when he arrives, how we can go through each question leading up to this last one. 
if, mm -hmm. if you think that's cool. Yeah, yeah, thanks for reminding me, my bad. So the first question, Shaul, is, is there a standard for love, why or why not? I'll put it in the chat if you need it. Shaul, can you hear us? Yeah, hold on one second. So while we wait, oh, go ahead, Shaul. No, I just wanted to say, um, yeah, well, while we wait, um, that, you know, those that's watching and listening, uh, we do understand there's a lot of variables, you know, so just remember that, keep that in mind, even if we say some of these things, um, it's variables. But the ideal is kind of what I'm doing. I'm kind of trying to stay on whatever questions it is. Um, it's a lot of great examples. I like the fact that both of them, both of the ladies um, brought out that the balance needs to be there. Uh, is he cool? Let me see. Oh, he's still, okay. Uh, that the balance needs to be there uh, when uh, distributing that love to that individual you with and children. Because when I said children, I don't want people say, you know, thinking, oh, man, no, my children, I, I'm going, I got to, no, love your children. You know, love them. You know, love the, love the life out of them. But, um, and, and, the, and the thought process with him, and I'm sure he's going to bring it out when he says about the being in love with one thing, I had to sit there and meditate for a day on that because it's like, that makes sense, but it's not for everybody. That's that right there. I'm ready that's now. a tough man right there. Like, you know what I'm saying? And any woman and man that thinks in the way that Shaul did, does with that, that's 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 a remnant thought. Like people go like, what? No, I love I mean man, I love my children, but I done seen people will jump into the casket with a significant other and children. That's a little too much right there. You know what I'm saying? I get it. <laughs> But that's too much, you know. But anyway, I you <laughs> so Chief, you own uh, he own too. So maybe after Shaul, we could uh, go through the questions for Chief too. All right, I'm gonna shut up. All right, wait, wait, wait. is this the first question? Still? Yeah, I put it in the thing. It, it says, "Is there a standard for love? Why or why not?" Is there a standard to love? Um, yeah, I think so. In, in a society like this, because it ain't no culture. When you don't have culture, there's no, uh, um, it's all over the place. So I would say it's really many, many standards. I wouldn't say it's one necessarily, but you know, and people, people love, and uh, one of the standards I would, uh, I would highlight is, uh, preferences. I always talk about that. You know, people, um, today we choose love based off of preferences. You know what I'm saying today, whereas in ancient times it wasn't like that, you know, and so, that, which is why people often make the wrong decision, as far as um, marrying someone or being in a relationship with someone, and then when something happens, then they, you know, basically put everybody else in a box. Like, yeah, it, it ain't nothing out here. So. Yeah, but I, but as far as the question, you know, directly, I think it's many standards that that America um, puts on uh, being in a relationship, being in a marriage, um, um, or or being in love, you know. Well, and Shema, I touched on. Um, well, Shema touched on it. I came in when he was explaining something. I was telling him a while back about falling in love, and um. And so since, you know, you guys talked about that a little bit, you know, I'll go into it as well. I'm going to say this, that um, to say there's a balance for everything. Of course, we have the, we have the most high creator as far as uh, setting, the, um, setting the playing field, which is this earth that we live on, and the order, the rules, and the regulations that's therein that we that we adhere to, but it's our but it's our job um, to to manifest. He gave us he gave us that ability. Well, he gave 
You know, you can see that in the beginning. You know, he gave Adam that ability, you know what I'm saying, to manifest things. So, um, so I, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm personally disregarding this notion that you don't have to do anything and that he's going to do everything because, again, if you out in the field, you know what I'm saying, if that was the case, then you wouldn't even need to eat when he's to use the bathroom. So at the end of the day, things are made with a balance. There's certain things that he controls, but the majority of this world, he allows us to control. And one thing I will say is this, as far as love and relationships go, is that, um, no, I, 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 I'm against this. Uh, I'm against the spirit of falling in love because when you fall in love with something, that means you put it on the pedestal um, to where it can do no wrong. Um, however, I will add to that by saying this. Um, I will add to that by saying this. There is a chain of command and order to life that we should adhere to. So that goes back to the balance. Is that, no, you shouldn't put the woman on the pedestal as a man. No, the woman shouldn't put the one, the man on the pedestal as a woman. However, there is a chain of command that must be adhered to. When you're talking about righteousness, there's supposed to be an overwhelmingly, uh, a overwhelming uh, level of admiration for one unto another. Um, there must be reverence one to another, honor one to another. Um, and the most high is in the midst of that. And so you can't just say, you know, um, you know, loving, you know, I, I love my woman or my man or whatever too much. Like, no, you shouldn't love them too much in the sense that you put them on the pedestal to where they can do no wrong. However, you do supposed to love them the way you was commanded to love them. And that can sometimes look like they're on the pedestal. However, the most high is in the center. And so I would say it's a 50-50 thing. You know what I'm saying? You know, um, in, in regards to the man and the woman is concerned, the most high always got to be first regardless. But sincerity and integrity is our characters and premise, principles that people should live by and adhere to so that you can love one another properly. Because are you going, I mean, because if you don't do that, or you don't have that, you're going to constantly be going back and forth with each other all the time. And again, the chain of command has to be respected. And the thing is, and the last thing I'm going to say is this, the reason why we even having these conversations should tell you just how severe this life is for us in this, in this modern time, because we're, we're having conversations that probably would have never been discussed thousands of years ago, because they had a culture, and they had certain things set in place. But today we're, we're having conversations that's stemming from pain, from hurt, from trauma. And we're allowing that to take over and cloud our judgment on um, making the proper decisions and being around those who deserve to have that reverence, that honor, and that love. You know what I'm saying? Because they show it, uh, uh, they show the same likeness. They, they, it's mutual between the two. And because that's what life is all about. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, I, because when you, I heard a couple of you guys, you know, speak on certain things. And when I, when I hear, when I hear things like that, it sounds as if, and it's not to say that that's what you really mean, but the way it's, it's been explained, it comes off as if there is a separation between um, really being there with someone because i mean you can't make someone happy it's your job to make your wife happy these vice versa you know what i'm saying it's your job to respect and honor one another it's your job to uh uh put them into uh, put them in certain to a certain atmosphere as far as you guys as union together i mean even with a friendship however the most high always got to be in the midst they always got to be um in there you know what i'm saying but to say that we can't make each other happy or we shouldn't, that's, that's asinine because we're put here for each other. That's why he said it, 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 it's, it's man should not be alone. So if it was just all about all oh, the most high, most high, most high, he wouldn't have gave Adam a wife. So at the end of the day, we need each other. It's very, very important that we come together to be with each other.
and that we make each other happy, that we do things that's thoughtful, that um, we utilize to make each other happy. Yeah. Now, one thing I can say about that is that, yeah, you, but a person before they enter into a union should already have a sense of uh, security within themselves and should already have a state of happiness already. I'm not disagreeing with that at all. But to sit here and say that we can't make each other happy or that we shouldn't, that's asinine because, again, we are made to become one. So in order for us to become one, those things, those little things, those thoughtful things that we do for one another is what make life living with each other worth it. That's what makes, that's what makes this life even worth living. So again, it's so many different prophets in the scriptures that had conversations with the Most High about uh, uh uh, about what makes life worth living. You know what I'm saying? Ezra was one of them. You know what I'm saying? You had a bunch of people that asked questions like, why Why are things the way that they are? But that's why I always talk about family and talk about togetherness. But it seemed like a lot of these conversations, though they're productive and though they're, they can be good, sometimes I don't think that we think about the things that we say when we make certain comments in regards to uh, uh, speaking on this life that we live uh, for ourselves and for each other. You know, it almost, it almost seems as if we try to separate one from another. This whole life is about becoming one. So b becoming one with everything, whether it's nature, yourself, your spouse, and the most high. It's not about being separate and only the most high is the only one that exists. That's not the case. It's about becoming one with all those in balance with one another. Because again, we need we need the we need the light that's around us. We need all, all the animals that's on this earth, the trees and everything that breathes, just like we do. We need that. We can't separate ourselves from that. So why would we try to separate ourselves from our spouse? But at the same time, you know, the problem is not, you know, what I'm saying loving someone too much. It's finding the balance between how to put things in proper perspective. You know, what I'm saying so that if you ever lost it. You can grieve because the scriptures tell you you're allowed to grieve, but you will move on. But if you get to a place to where you can't move on, then you 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 gave too much. You know what I'm saying? So, and that's it. I'm gonna yield with that. And we're gonna ask the same questions. I'm not sure if Zebulon. Uh, uh, so, Chawa, I think you kind of answered both questions that. We already uh, got to. So the first question, Zebulon, is: um, Is there a standard for love? Why or why not? Shalom, everybody. Shalom, everybody out um, on the panel. Everybody out there um, tuning in. Um, yeah. I, well, no, no. As far as standard for love, that's an extremely uh, subjective question. Subjective and relative. Um, and the reason I say it's relative and subjective is because it, it's it's kind of like in the vein of Leviticus 19, uh, I believe it's uh, verse 18, where we talk about, you know, loving your brother or neighbor, as, you know, as some people say, as yourself. The underlying, uh, the underlying uh, 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 piece of that law is that there's an assumption that there is love preceding that law. Because the, the commandment is telling us to love your neighbor as you love yourself. The key is, do you love yourself? And to what extent do you love yourself? That'll determine the standard in which you love somebody. Because you can only give what you have. So if I don't love myself, well, <laughs> then anybody who gets involved with me, they already know what to expect. You know, they're going to get... Well, I'm not going to say it on air, but that's what you're going to get. You're going to get crap. Um, but someone, of course, who does love themselves and, and, and have gone through, and gone through the proper uh, processes and channels um, to understand that self-love, to understand that love that the Most High implanted in them from the beginning, then when they go forward to, um, to illustrate that love to someone else, then there's an abundance to give because they have the, an abundance. So, you know, this, so yeah, I, I'm, you know, my, my answer to that is going to be extremely uh, uh, short. And again, it's, it's very relative. It's very subjective as far as um, standards. But 
whatever your standard is, whatever you know, whatever standard that you hold love to be, it, it it can only be a reflection of what already exists within you. What? How do you feel about you? Do you love you? Um, and if you're not sure if you love you, then all you have to do is look at your relationships. Have has love manifested correctly in those relationships going? Uh, you know, in the past, has it manifested? If not, well, then we know that okay. Then I need to, I need to do some more work because clearly I have I have, do not understand what this love thing is. I don't. So very relative, um, and I and I think anybody who thinks it's not relative, hey, maybe they you know maybe they box themselves into maybe they have a a, a, a tighter understanding of love, and and if that's the case. Hallelujah! All you know, more power to them, or whatever. But again, it depends on who you ask. Um, I, I know people, um, friends and family, you know, that they'll tell you that they love you, but be like, yeah, but I've kind of known you for 35, 40 years. I, I, I know that that love is very, very limited. I, because I see how you move with everybody, you know, and so you, you, know, you, you, you accept the pint for a pint. You know, it is what it is. But there are some people who I know that they will literally, when I say literally, they will give you the last dollar. If they, if, if, if helping you out means they got to come up short in the rent, they're going to come up short on the rent. They're going to help you and then figure out later on how they're going to pay their rent. Because they're like, no, I love you. I don't want you to be jacked up. I'll be fine. You got to get on your feet. So there's, so, you know, you're going to run into, you know, people with different understandings of love. And that's also a part of the courting process, not just courting in relationships for marriage, but relationship, um, courting for friendship. Uh, when, when you get to know people and you get to see where their, their level of um, love is, then that can be the standard that you gauge them by and say, okay, I know what type of love they're bringing to the table. Cool. I can match that. Or, eh, he or she is a slacker. No, I can't deal with that level of love. That's some, that's some, weak nonsense or that's some extra next level love i don't know I, I might not be ready for that but all of this is different levels and as long as we understand that it has everything to do with how you view love to yourself that'll determine um the standard in which you um, dictate love for anybody else going forward and with that i'll yield yeah excellent points i'm, I'm going to go ahead and just ask you this next question because we we had already said asked two questions. So the next question that we've already gone through, but I wanted to get your take is um is it possible to, to love your partner too much? It's a trick question. Um th that question is of the devil. Um <laughs> but it, it's no it's 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 it, it it's a tricky thing because I, I think a lot of times um and for good reasons. And, and so when I say what I'm about to say, I'm not saying it in a negative way. But I think sometimes it's necessary to love people, maybe as some people would say, love them too much, because sometimes people have to be shown examples of love. So you have to compensate. Sometimes, you know, even if you're equally yoked, even if it's an ox with an ox, every ox, it doesn't have the same power. Some oxen are just brutish, like, yeah, you know, they get, they get that work in. Whatever. Some oxen, are, eh, you know, they're strong, but maybe not on that level. So sometimes if you have two oxen who might be on the same platform, on the same level, but varying degrees of strength, one ox has to compensate for the other in order to get the job done. There's work to be done. That's why they're under the yoke. <laughs> There's work to be done. But sometimes your partner may be slacking. There's a reason why the Most High said that it is, and, and, and this is only from a relationship standpoint that I'm using this, but there's a reason why the Most High says that it is not good that man should be alone. Because before he said that, what did he establish with man? He established that man has work to do. You are a husband, man. You are the caretaker of this planet as I am the God of all worlds, you are the God of this world now. This is your domain. Everything is under your power and under your command. 
you name them, that means that you give every living creature, every living being on this planet, you have given them a name, meaning that you have given them a meaning and a purpose that prior did not exist. You are now giving them a purpose in this world, but it is not good that you are alone. So I'm going to make you a help that is fit for you because you got work to do and you're going to need someone else under that yoke that's going to help you with that work, but could potentially, if you're slacking a little bit and kind of, you know, kind of jacked up a little, falling off a little on the strength, that that partner can come and say, hey, don't worry about it. I'll compensate. I'll compensate where you're slacking right now because I know you're tired. And vice versa. This is what the work is about. This is the reason why the first job man was given was to be a tiller of the earth. To till the earth. To make the earth suitable for planting. Some heavy work there. So there's, there has to be a corresponding help to make these things move forward. But sometimes we're not always on the same exact strength level. And so you have to come in to overcompensate, to show them that, hey, listen, while you get it together, I'm going to bring my, you know, so, so now it's going to be a 45-55 split right now. You're slacking, I'll make it up with an extra five. Either way, the work still gets done. So when we're loving each other, yes, you know, yes, you know what I'm saying, um, you know, it's possible to, you know, to quote unquote, um, love somebody too much, but in, in many cases, that's necessary. It's a good thing. Um, as long as we understand the difference between love and um, you know being a you know being a uh, um, a psycho <laughs> where it ain't where it's no longer love you know you're you're just you know psychotically infatuated with a person and you know you know these are the people who eventually become axe murderers but if we have a if we have a healthy understanding of what love is at least from the platform that we established in point one then yes sometimes that person needs to see a, a more abundant example of love. I know I did when I was younger because I didn't see that. I can't, I grew up in a very dysfunctional household where love was something that either equated with money, like, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, you know, love is love as long as money's involved. It kind of sounds like prostitution, but that's what I was raised up in. So you connected love with what you can get from a person, money cars, clothes. This is what the understanding was. So I didn't trust that because I saw how fickle that was when I was young. So you don't trust it. But then it always takes somebody to come in and say, hey, I know your understanding of love is jacked up. I know because I see what was given to you. Let me show you what love is. And so they, they love you even more so to overcome, to compensate for what's lacking on your end and it helps balance it out. So now you got more coming in that you can use and build you up, then they can go back to their level because they just leveled you off. So if it's done in that, in, in that context, then yeah, I don't see no problem with quote unquote loving somebody <laughs> too much because it's only to their benefit because you know you'll get it right back. As soon as, it, as soon as their cup overflows, they're going to bring it right back to you and it'll go into you. And so it's a constant exchange. You're just constantly going back and forth with the flow. It's like Tai Chi, so to speak. You know what I'm saying? It's a, it's a beautiful thing. But again, it all assumes that the person has a, a, a grounded sense of what love is and not some, uh, you know, not some neurotic, uh, <laughs> not some neurotic definition of it, you know, that, you know, but I, and I think we know where I'm going with that. But um, as long as we have a healthy understanding of it, then yeah, I don't see any problem with it because sometimes we need it. This world beats us down. Every, every day you step foot out of your home and you go to work and you're around people that don't give you love all day. You're in a job. They don't love you. They just care about what you can give to the job. You know what I'm saying? Or you're in school. They don't care. You know, they don't care about you. They care about what type of grades you're going to make, you know, whatever. They, so we've, we've, we spend most of our time in this world not being exposed to genuine love. So a lot of times we start losing faith in that possibility because we don't see it. So if you are a person who has that and you see that other person, that your partner or your friend, they're lacking in that area as a help fit 
you're supposed to come in and say, hey, don't worry, I got us. Until you get your situation right, I got it. Then when you get up, I can go back to where I'm at. And then when I'm on the, when I'm on the downswing, you come and bring me up. This is what we do. So it's, it's you know, so yeah, it, I, I feel that it's a, it's a very good thing to quote unquote love um, more than maybe we should or whatever like that. Because again, it's all for the purpose of building one another up. If not, why are we tilling the earth? And with that, I'll, um, I'll yield. That was excellent. That's right. Yeah, that was, that was, <laughs> that was excellent. I think it too reminded me of Ecclesiastes. I forget what chapter it is, but the one that is it, whatever, is it, a, a two, you know, the chapter about two. It's better than two, whatever. Anyway, it reminds me of that. And I think too that, um, uh, yeah, that's a lot. It's a lot. That was good though. So the, the last question is, um, I almost, I thought to put it in there, but I didn't. All right. So the last question is, how do you balance your understanding of love with what your partner thinks is love? And I'm going to put it in the chat and I'll say it again. How do you balance your understanding of love with what your partner thinks is love? And I put the order back in there. Um, so if you could scroll up and find it, y'all. But I'll put the question in there now. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, hit me. All right, um, waiting to see this question. Let me pull up my internet. That's a fun name when you think about it, a funny name, internet. How do you balance your understanding of love with what your partner thinks is love? Hmm. How do you balance your understanding of love with what your partner thinks is love? Um, this goes back to what we always talking about. Y'all already know what I'm about to say. This thing should be known in the courtship phase. This should be known. You should, you should, um, I think, you know, even before being in a relationship or being married, you all should come to an agreement of what it is. Once you all come to that agreement, then um, you probably won't have to do what this question is saying because you already both uh, agreed on it. It's some things that you have to agree on. So have a foundation. Uh, collectively and this is one of those major things that you all need to figure out before going forward or being together uh, that's just my take that's my thoughts um, but if if it wasn't to be the case what I'm bringing out um, then I don't know I can't speak I, I really can't speak on that to be honest with you because I'm not going to operate in that way I'm literally with whoever I end up with. That's going to be something that's addressed um, in the beginning. Uh, what is your understanding of love? Um, what is my understanding of, lo of love? Because um, ideally, and not even ideally, but uh, what needs to be done, that understanding needs to be known and if we want to go forward and modify it for both of us uh, in order to be together, because I'm not going to be with anyone that does not have an almost identical understanding of love. Let me say that again. I'm not going to be with anyone that doesn't have almost an identical understanding of love. Because if you don't have that almost identical understanding of love, then it's going to be confusion within that household. And then that confusion is going to be passed down to your children. 
And now their life is, it's going to be a constant cycle. Something I posted yesterday, I started with the, the mother and the father. So that has to be known. That has to be um, agreed upon. That cannot be, cannot be a disagreement with that part of it. Because ultimately that's what we are supposed to be teaching our children. Um, and how, what we're supposed to operate in. So every household is different. So in your household, it has to be um, one and the same in that particular subject, at least. So that's my answer. That won't even happen with me. So I can't answer it in a way that it won't. Uh, that has to be one of the first things understood. And um, I'm not saying that in a way to where I'm controlling. I'm saying that in a way to where I have to agree with hers as well. You know what I'm saying? I literally have to agree with hers as well because if we're gonna produce children, we have to have that understanding. So, uh, with that I yield. Okay. So I agree with um, what Shema was saying. I think that um, it's important to already have an understanding where both of you agree um, what love is, but I think that would be us. I also think that that's us coming from a um, biblical perspective. So coming from, um, I'll say a worldly or secular perspective on people, how they view love, I would say um, that yes, we should agree on um, what love is, but we have to hold on we have to um i just had the word i always draw a blank affection the thing that pe people usually equate love with affection so i would say if we have a understanding on what love is now i want to balance on my perspective of affection and yours because um there's this thing called um like the five love languages or something like that and it's how people perceive um it's basically affection they say love whatever but it's affection so most people some people um are touchy feely so they like hugs forehead kisses some people like gifts and some people like positive affirmations so i would say Yes, we can agree on um, what love is. And I know for my household, um, that is an action to us. Um, love is an action, but affection is also a part of love, but our views on affection is different. Our views on how we, um, how we like to, um, be appreciated or feel appreciated is different. So I feel like if our views on um, love is the same, and then you also understand the way in which I receive affection and the way that I receive appreciation and the things that make me happy and vice versa, I know those things about you, um, then we good and that's the balance. We know what love is and I know that um, you like to watch movies and play the game. So I'm watching movie, play the game, which is something like that. I like forehead kisses and stuff like that. So I think that's the balance. Um, understanding what love is with one another, but also understanding like Shaul was trying to, um, what, well, not trying, what, like what Shaul brought out about, you have to make each other happy. You have to, um, you know, once you're doing those, those loving um, actions for each other, then, other stuff going to come to play like flower, be it flowers or dates or whatever the case. So I just think it's, you know, that and I yield. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm glad you brought the book, The Love Language. Um, and that's a good book to everybody, for everybody to read that have different types of it. I can't think of the name of the author right now, but it is called, it, yeah, it's called The Five Love Languages, that's what it's called, and they have different types for kids, for singles, for married couples, I forget what the other um, uh, sections are, but anyway, but it's, it's a good book, so, and it talks about some of the stuff that Shamika was talking about, some people 
you know, like to be touched. Some people like uh, acts of service or uh, words of affirmation, and I forget what the other ones are. So anyway, um, uh, so I would say to the question again, uh, how do you balance your understanding of love with what your partner thinks is love? I think uh, for me personally, it is the Torah is the foundation first and foremost for me. If, if I get married again, it will have to be that we both agree that this is a, this is a must and it's not up for discussion. The, and so on top of that, and I only brought that up because I was thinking about Shamika and talking about flowers and things like that. Like that's what we think love looks like. Take me out to dinner. Uh, <laughs> give me a massage, which leads to babies. You know what I'm saying? People do stuff like that. That okay, you love me, do stuff like that. But um, that's cool. It's it's kind of the same way that you know somebody would um construct their household um just in general. You know, you have the foundational truths, and then you have things that you add on for flavor that represents you two as individuals with, with individual uh function. You know, the desires or whatever. So. But I would say also that in order to even get to that point, um, as far as understanding your what you, uh, as far as understanding what you think love is, is of course it's conversation, right? But it's not just conversation. So we talked about it early on, and, um, and we haven't said it in a, in, a, in a while. But the whole customer service representative, right? So when you are interested in somebody or they're interested in you, they'll show you their, I don't say their best sales, but they'll show you parts of themselves that are not really the full self, but just to get your attention, because it's like, I'm gonna show you mine, show me yours, you know, you, you kind of, you know, start to like each other based off of that. But I think that um, having conversations and then watching how people love other people, I, I think that's big is that, you know, if the person don't respect their parents, they can't love you. Like y'all probably not gonna be on, the, not can't, that sounds fixed, but it's gonna, you will be a fool to think that they're going to turn around and love you the way you want to be loved, right? So if they have, and even, um, I think Zebulon mentioned this a long time ago, but talking to former girlfriends or spouses, like, you know, do that. You know what I'm saying? Because people tell you stuff and you don't really know, we probably should be talking to them. You know what I'm saying? And I think, and I'm saying only to say that because um, people are, we are creatures of habit. So the way that we love is not in our conversation. We love by what we do. So if this person that you're interested in is is uh, and I'm only talking from the from a singles perspective, but you you're interested in them, they're interested in you, you they they gonna have to show you. And it, and it, it's up to you to pay attention because even in conversations, uh there has to be consistency in what they show you. And if there's not, then that that's definitely a uh, you know a red flag as far as um you thinking you're gonna make them love you the way you want them to love you. Um and then oh also then also you know if you know once you well, well, not once, but if you're in a situation where you're, you know, single, um, not wanting them to change, I think a lot of times we, as women, we will look at, at, at men and we'll think, especially black women, we feel like we could, you know, change our men, you know what I'm saying, or do things for them, but I'm not saying that that's not the case. I look at my brother, um, uh, you know, having a, he has, he gave testimony when he was on the show, but you know, he went, he's not, he wasn't always the person he is now, but he had a good foundation, you know, and through my father. So, but you know, we all go, like, like Zebulon said, you go through situations where you're not always your best self and so that your partner is to be there to, to help, to show you what love looks like. But, um, but we should never feel like we could, my personal opinion, never feel like you could change somebody to, to, to give you what, to give you the love that you want. If they're not showing you that in the beginning, and I'm talking about bare minimum things that, like I said, Torah, um, honoring the Torah, observing it. And um, and, and I think, Shemaya, you said this too, I thought, which I thought was brilliant. You know, even the, uh, um, and it's kind of, I think it's kind of controversial, I think in the, uh, um, in some communities, but, you know, find somebody that's like your match. You know what I'm saying? Like, if you're a person that enjoys certain activities, um, It'd be cool to at least find somebody that is on the same page. They might not want to go through everything you want to go through or do the same, every same, you know, you're going to have differences. But if you can, if you could take your time and vet and weed people out, I, I would say if you're single, do that. Take your time, look at people, observe, watch them, talk to them, watch them, and um, let that be the thing so that, that once you are married, you won't be in a situation where you're like, uh, he don't love me the way I thought he was going to love me, you know, because a lot of times we laugh to ourselves about what somebody is and is not going to do for us. And if we love ourselves, going back to the original point, if we love ourselves, we'll um, 
will take more time to to uh, be optimistic about finding a partner that truly is your match. So, I'm done. Is it me? Yes. Okay. So, let me turn that off. Um, the question is, how do you how do you balance your understanding of love with what your partner thinks is love? Okay. Um first of all, because I you know, the tour, you know, when we had these discussions, you know, the tour always get brought up. And you know what's crazy about these conversations to me? They bittersweet to me. Because um it is it, sweet because people need to talk about these things to get an understanding, but it's bitter sometimes because we kind of tend to uh, say things, you know what I'm saying, um, which manifest in our actions that is not conducive to getting a result or the solution of why we even talking about this in the first place. Um, but I would say this, um, understanding love is understanding life and accepting life and what life has to offer. And all that is, because I mean, the scriptures is a, is a helping hand in that, but it's not enough to just understand life, but rather a person accept the cards that's dealt by life. You know what I'm saying? And once you, have, once you master accepting what, what life has to offer you, you will, you know, and make the best of it, you will never be hurt again. So, you know, I, I always hear people make excuses about um, going in into thing, into new things, whether it be a man going into a relationship with a woman but was hurt in the past or vice versa. And that's not a good mindset to have. At the end of the day, life is about the good and the bad. It's a balance between the two. That's actually how you earn your way into what we all trying to walk into as the kingdom, right? That's what everybody said. We trying to walk into the kingdom. So it's about balancing the two. It's, it's about it's about no matter what, no matter what situation you're in, that that praise and that glory go to the Most High, but that you keep a positive outlook constantly, because you are gonna get dealt bad hands all the time. It's gonna happen. It's not. You're not gonna all. You're not gonna get all aces or kings or queens all the time. So at the end of the day, it's about that balance. Now, what is love? I always say it, man. It's simple. To me, life is simple to understand, which makes it easier for me to understand things and go through things, even when I'm in my down periods. All love is is loyalty and sacrifice. You know what I'm saying? Um, and is you know loyalty and sacrifice. If you a person, uh, and, and, and loyalty is a is a <laughs> it's a skill. You know what I'm saying? It's definitely a skill, and it could be a gift too, depending on the uh, type of person you are. But not everybody have it because a lot of people, especially in a society like this, are self aggrandizers man. You know, self worshippers. They want all the attention on them. But really, the 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 the, the, the uh, true testament of life. Is being selfless and giving yourself for someone else. That's what that's what sacrifice is. You know what I'm saying? And so at the end of the day, you know, now that I went over that, you know, um, I do want to say this. You know, what's really the point of these conversations if it's not to go back to the culture? Because you know, I keep hearing tour ride. I keep, you know, you know, we keep ha we have this conversation all the time. You know, every week. Or I've been on. You know, I think it's like my seventh or eighth show. I've been on, and you know we we always mention Torah, we always mention these things. But what is the point? Of, uh, what is the point of the of these conversations if not to go back to that? Now, to answer the question directly, as far as the balance the two, what there shouldn't really because if we if 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 Torah is the standard, <laughs> there shouldn't be no how you balance the two because first of all the woman is supposed to 
adhere to the man's vision. That is the art of becoming one. Now, and that's why I was saying, like, when we had these conversations, we keep, you know, it, it seems it seems to be that when we make certain comments, it seems to be separating um, the art of one mind and making it two, but still saying it's one. And it's like, I'm not, I'm not rocking with that. I don't agree with that at all. Because at the end of the day, if the act, if the, the creation of life, which is, you know, was started with Adam, and Adam named the animals, you know, he was given a vision by the most high to see, you know, he was given leadership, he was given that authority. Not saying that the woman don't doesn't have power, the woman has power too. But the problem is a lot of women today just don't have the wherewithal, the wisdom to understand how much power they have, even though they're not the leaders or the authority. And I'm just going, I'm just keeping it a hundred all the way. So, I mean, I'm sorry if anybody get offended by what I'm saying, but at the end of the day, you know what I'm saying? You know, we talk about, you know, the man being the CEO or whatever, and the woman being the manager and so on and so forth. So you guys going back and forth on you understanding the love, like, like, what does that even mean? Because at the end of the day, you know, the love, love and the union is all loyalty and sacrifice. You both, you, both of you guys sacrifice uh, are loyal to each other and sacrifice for each other constantly, even for your own children. So that's a given. Now you work other things out. You know, uh, you know, somebody brought up the flowers and you know, going date nights. Those things you're supposed to do. Those things you're supposed to make time for one another. This is how you grow. I mean, you talk about a union. This, this is a this is a everlasting growth. A union is an everlasting growth. Meaning, meaning that it takes a lifetime to um, uh, um, it takes a lifetime to walk a journey with someone. You know what I'm saying? Um, and it's going to be a, a journey of ups and downs. And that has to be understood. But to make love anything else other than a, a simple thing, and that's really all it is because it's a verb anyway. It's not even a feeling or anything like that. You know what I'm saying? The feelings are, are, are what you, you know, these feelings that you, that, you know, we call euphoric or whatever are just satisfaction, you know what I'm saying, in the moments. And that's great. You're supposed to experience that. Your body is supposed to release those chemicals so that you can feel those moments. You know what I'm saying? But true happiness, though, you know what I'm saying, in my thought process is the sacrifice from one to another, selflessness from one to another giving yourself to someone else. You know what I'm saying? And that's when you start to understand how precious life is and how important it is to cherish those who are with you, that support you, that love you, that's in your circle as much as possible because when they leave, you probably would never experience that again with anyone else because that's how scarce it is. And at the end of the day, if we're going to keep it 100 according to the question, when a, when a man leave his wife and his mother, I mean, his uh, father and his mother, and he cleave unto his wife, that woman is supposed to adhere to the man's vision. And then them guys work on a plan together to bring that vision to fruition because the woman is essential and is important, period. So I'm not trying to exclude her, but you should not go into a relationship with a thinking that you that you can have a different mindset and that y'all not going to be at odds with each other because that ain't Torah. So again, if Torah is the standard that we supposed to adhere to, then it should be you going into that relationship to adhere to that man's standard. You know what I'm saying? And of course, his job as a head of household is supposed to bring um, a certain level of balance He's not supposed to abuse his authority. And this is the reason for the elders in the community because you guys are not alone. You guys are not just marrying each other. You are marrying the most high. You're also marrying your community. I mean, why do you think they say things like it takes a village to raise a child? I mean, it takes a village to make a, a boy and to turn a boy into a man, a woman into a woman. So at the end of the day, um, this is why you have counsel. This is why you have elders. This is why you have 
those who care for your well-being so that the man doesn't abuse his power and that the woman can fall right into place into that system so that you guys can walk that journey and to death do you part. And I'm going to yield with that. Interesting. That was a good, um, that was a good platform. Um, I, um, it kind of touched on, um, kind of touched on something that I was going to hit. So I'm not going to, um, I'm not going to uh, reinvent the wheel. Uh, but I'm going to say as far as the, um, you know, uh, the question of how do you balance your understanding of love with what your partner thinks is love? It, I think essentially it goes back to what Shema said, I mean, because this is something that we we've covered um, uh, we've covered so many times during the course of this um, the love language uh, show uh, on Zoom and as well as uh, blog talk, and uh, we talk about the importance of um, of courting, and I think that I don't think we can actually speak on it enough uh, because the process eliminates. Um, so much skullduggery um uh it well if we're using it correctly uh it eliminates skullduggery uh from the onset and uh but as far as but but aside from the skullduggery <laughs> um balancing uh, our understanding of love with what our partner's uh, love is i think it goes again it goes right back to uh as ben ami would say let us go back to the genesis um again we find ourselves like uh like uh uh uh, uh Akshawo said we find ourselves in the garden and we see that man of course has been entrusted uh with the duty of caring for the earth this is his task and everything in it uh trying to find the balance starts with First, both parties understanding what the end goal is. Like, what is the end game? Are we working for the same company? Or are we working for competing companies? I think a lot of times, in, 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 um, with, you know, and, and again, it, it, I think these are, uh, these are conversations, like uh, Akshaw said, these are conversations that only exist in the African-American um uh, frame of thinking that the, 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 these type of discussions would have been insane to our ancestors. It, it just wouldn't have made any sense. But in this day and time, we have been convinced, told and convinced that um, that you can be married and have, you know, and, and both the, both spouses can have completely different um, goals. Like, hey, I'm doing me over here, you doing you, and the only thing that we're doing is sharing bills. That is insanity. Because for all that, uh, why are we together? <laughs> I can continue doing my I can continue doing my thing over here, and you can continue doing your thing over there. This is not what the most high meant when he said that it is not good that man should be alone. There was an understanding that when the woman was brought to him, that she was also going to be a gardener. She wasn't going to go and find some other employment with the with the nakash for the servant or find some other things to do over on the side or whatever. Like, no, there's a reason. No, you need to be here. The man is over here tilling. Well, go get your tools or whatever like that and get the tilling too. You're part of this process. So the reason so now you have a balance when there is an understanding of what it is, what are we laboring for? Are we laboring for the same things? And if we are, then the balance comes where, because I think we also tend to believe that it has to be um, not in the same vein as what Shema said as far as having the exact same outlook, but more so what is the, you know what I'm saying, do we have the same end goal? And I use the example of construction sites. I've spent a lot of time over the years doing security and whatnot on construction sites. And so I've had opportunity to watch people on these sites the process of building and you got all of these people you got the brick masons you got the 
um, you know, you got you, you got the uh, uh, um, the sheet rockers, you got all of these different uh, the, the electricians, the plumbers, so on and so forth. All of these people with completely different skill sets, yet laboring on the same structure and bringing it to fruition. So from what so from what I what I've gleaned from that is that even if we don't have the same exact um the same exact understanding of it, my question is even if it's not the, exactly the same, does their understanding of it does it mesh with the goal that's at hand? She may have a different skill set than I have. But is her skill set going to bring uh, going to bring fruition to the completion of the task? And if it does, and if it you know, and if it will, then I'll even consider that. But yes, during the quarter process, all these things have to be worked out. There has to be a there has to be a synergy involved. Uh, like like Shama said, there has to be something there where it's like, okay, you know what you got to do. I know what I got to do. This is the goal. This is how we're going to get it done. You ready to work? You ready to rock? Let's get it. And we move forward. But I think that a lot of, um, a, you know, a, a lot of, and I'm not sure who said it, but a lot of what you're seeing today in, in, in so-called African-American relationships is you're seeing people with different agendas using marriage to cover up what it really is. And what it really is, is a financial arrangement. You're getting somebody who, well, you know what? I'm doing me, and I don't really care what they're doing, uh, just as long as just as long as the bills get paid at the end of the month. That's it, whatever like that. That's in a business arrangement. That's not even a marriage anymore. That, that like it's like you don't even <laughs> we don't even need each other. Like if we don't we don't even ever physically see each other ever again, it doesn't matter. Just as long as you send the checks. That's pretty much what marriage and relationships in the African American uh, paradigm has become. Their business arrangements, and not even business. It's it's really just harlotry. It's it, 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 you know, it's harlotry. It's whoremongering and it's whoring and whoremongering, um, uh, legitimized by finance. And this is what we're this is what we're faced with. And even in the even in the Hebrew community, there's people who are Hebrews, but they have still they have brought in the ways of the world into the community, and are now trying to what I call they're trying to wrap turbans around swine. They're trying to Hebraicize madness. And so there has to be an understanding that of the, the initial goal. What, is, what are we trying to accomplish, not only with this union, but what are we trying to accomplish with this life? Because if we're gonna spend the next 25, 30, 40 years together, I, I have to kind of have, I have to have some type of assurity that the end goal is going to be accomplished, that you're down for the end goal and that you're not working for another team. And just kind of like, and, and, and this has to be a back and forth discussion between the parties in the very beginning of the, of these, um, you know, of the courting process, because if not, all we're going to do is just, we're just going to spend all of our time, you know, speaking good things, speaking, uh, you know, uh, speaking smooth things as uh, the prophets say, you know, speaking smooth things and not right things, you know, we're saying things that sound good and that they, you know, they, they resonate with people, they tickle the ear or whatever like that. But at the end of the day, you know, there is no, there's no synergy. We're not working together. We just happen to be occupying the same space and paying the same bills. Um, so with all that said, I know I kind of rambled on, on to another, uh, another um, concept, whatever. But uh, yeah, uh, you know, balancing, uh, you know, balancing our understanding of love with the other person. It all has to do with do we do we see that other person's uh, do they, does their platform play into the ultimate accomplishing of the goal at hand? If it plays into that goal, all praise to the most high. Let's move. You know, and during the quarter process, we can work out whatever kinks. Because at least we know that all of our work, your labor and my labor, is going to that end goal. So it's worth the it's worth the journey. Any you know, any little nicks in the, you know, in the, in the process, a little speed bumps. That's what it is. That's part of driving. You're going to hit a speed bump. 
you're gonna you know, someone's gonna be rubbernecking. It's gonna you know, there's gonna be little pauses in the driving, whatever it happens. But are we gonna get to the goal? Are we gonna get to the destination? If, if, if you know if, if it is, so let's get it done. Let's go. And with that, I yield. All right, cool. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Appreciate it. Uh, I hope tomorrow. If you allow me to do this, I'm, this could be my closing too, by the way. I don't, that was the last question, right? All right. So, it was a few things I just wanted to say, and if anybody else wanted to do closing, that's cool too. Um, so, the question really quick, I just want to, because there's some things I want to say. Um, how do you balance your understanding of love with what your partner thinks is love? Uh, I loved a lot of the things that were said, like with Shaul, she said, all of y'all, actually. Um, I, for a lot of these topics, I don't like splitting, like saying this is for, like uh, Shamika has said, she was like, you know, like my response was more so biblical. I want to say that it's even if I wasn't in the truth, like that has to be done for those outside because a lot of the people that I deal with when I talk to them, and they speak on different things with their relationships and stuff like that. They're not in the truth. So I see a common now, I see a common denominator with their failures. And that goes into what we're talking about with the court and courtship. And that's why I said like, we have to be almost identical as far as what love what we see love to be in order to even go take that next step. Because I, what I see with a lot of people from my mom to my other family members, the people outside, it's, it's something in the beginning that's not being uh, said, it's not being uh, addressed, it's not being on a side. When you think of teams, when you think of businesses, when you think of anything, all these things, they have a, before they sign that contract, this is what has to be. Yes, sir. There's no differences in this regard. Love is the foundation of everything dealing with the marriage, dealing with what the Most High wants us to do. So this has to be edged in stone. I looked up the definition of love, and it's interesting. And this is the noun of love. It says an intense feeling of deep affection. Now, Shamika brought up affection, and I wanted to throw that in there because Affection, from my point of view, um, it's different types of affection. So I love what Shaul brought out with the loyalty and sacrifice. The sacrifice within the love um, still pins point that initial thing I'm talking about. We have to have agreements of what love is, where we, we have to come to a common understanding of what love is together because that sacrifice part he's talking about is already a given. So I should be able to, what a lot of you all speak on with the love language book that's out, uh, that's out there, you know, this is my love language, this is my love language. I get it. That should just be a given by the man and the woman though. You know what I'm saying? That should be, um, you as the husband, as the man should, should adhere to and to pay attention to what the woman likes, what she needs, what she what she needs for things to be right, and vice versa. My co my cousin, I mean my uncle, who's a year younger than me, they got a podcast, and he was saying he didn't pay attention to that. You know, she she had this, she needed this, he didn't pay attention. That's just a given. You know, I, the love language. I mean, not the love language. So, yeah, the love language. But I get that affection type. So I get the different stuff but that should be something that we should pay attention to. We shouldn't need that book to tell us to see that about the other individual. We should be able to see it, we should be able to know. But the reason that book is needed is because most people don't pay attention. They are what you said, uh, selfish. They're selfish. Not in a, I'm not saying in a full negative sense, but in a sense that they not being, they're not paying attention outside of themselves. I don't believe that everybody is selfish, but I do believe at one point in their life, they were 
selfish and some have to grow from that. Just like I don't believe everybody is a sinner. I don't believe that. Um, I believe you you brought out something when it talks about repent. Um, in First Samuel, I think it was, they had to repent means to turn away from means don't go back to it. So you learn from that sin, you grow and you don't do that sin again or you try not to. Um, I wrote down some things real quick. Another thing I wanted to point out that kind of goes into what Shaul was speaking of, and this is what a lot of people, matter of fact, before I go forward, Isaiah wrote something. He said, we don't be, he said, we don't, we don't be, I'm going to read it how you wrote it, because I don't know how you was trying to say it in this first part. We don't be know what we, what went on in the past. We just expect them to give it. No, that's not the one that you wrote something else about. Oh, hold on, hold on, hold on, y'all. I'm trying to find what he has said. It was something about the Torah. It was something about the Torah. Dang. He basically said, um, like, establish it, because I can't find what you said. I could, if you could copy and paste it, I could read it. Um, you know, we have this Torah foundation, but even with that being said, some people have a different understanding of what Torah is. And that could be a problem itself. Um, so what I wanted to bring out is when you think of uh, Israel and how the Most High will operate, he called us two things. He called us children. And then we also was like the wife. He was a husband, right? And what popped in my head, and this kind of goes in what Isaiah was speaking of, I think he can correct me. And I know I'm going, we're going over y'all, but I just, I, this put on me to bring out, man, about this topic. Um, the Numbers 30, Numbers 30 talks about the vows and we all spoke on the vow stuff. It's two points where for the woman, it's, 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 it's going for the children. No, 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 it's going for the woman, right? You have um, where, the, where the vow could be null and voided when the father steps in and then you have the one where the husband can step in. He actually can null and void the, the vow that's made. Why is that? Why is it that the not only the father, but also the husband can do that according to this culture, according to the Torah? A lot of people in the truth, I've heard people that don't, they don't like that, 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 that chapter. A lot of women, they do not like that chapter because a lot of men use it in the wrong way. I, but I equate that to two things, to what I'm seeing with how God operated with Israel, calling them uh, the children and or the wife. But I also um, equate that to what Shaul is kind of bringing out with the, the structure and the vision. And then going into what Chief Zeb is talking about with, um, you know, the, the end goal or the initial goal, you know, it, it, it goes right into uh, the foundation and the structure is how I look at it. So um, I think that I'm going to end it by saying this. I just wanted to point those out. I, I'm, I think that um, that's not just a biblical thing. I think the problem is we're separating the biblical and we we're putting it with the, like with the book, love language book. I think none of that stuff even matters at the end of the day, that foundation, that um, unity, that echad that you both have to do and put in place in the beginning has to be set for all the other stuff, the affection and all that stuff, that stuff matters, but that should be a given. That should be a given. This book, I ain't even read the book. Why? Because I feel like the stuff that's in the book is what we all been talking about anyway. And I can't, that might be uh, arrogant of me, I guess, but I'm not really trying to be arrogant when I say that. I'm literally, the stuff that I hear y'all talking about within the book is the stuff that we're talking about on the show. The stuff that we're, this is stuff we supposed to pay attention to as the husband and or the wife. We supposed to see this stuff, but why don't we see it? Because we, are what you said selfish 
we're not looking and caring. We're, 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 we're so focused. It has to be what Shaul and Chief said, a balance. It has to be a balance across the board. And that's it, man. That's it. I just wanted to put that out there. Maybe that was a long rant, but I just felt like it needed to be put out there. And um, that's it. Okay, in closing, I just um, wanted to say, one, I have not read the love language book. I just know about it, and I know the five things that they say are love languages. But I also wanted to um, clear or clear up the fact that I I don't um I don't think it's separate either. Um love period is I just was saying that um what people would perceive is the biblical perspective just because that was um like that's the foundation who that really, really laid out on how it should be done, on what loyalty looks like, on what sacrifice looks like and all of that, you know, being love and stuff like that. But I was just saying, the only reason why I separated the two, um, based off experience for one, and um, or why I seen my separated the two, experience and you know conversations with like my aunts and cousins and stuff like that, they don't see love, especially loyalty has never been a thing that my aunt expressed to me as like um love her thing was you can do your thing he can do his thing as long as he take like as long as he pay the bills that's all that matters so people like that and they just they think it's a 100 percent feeling and i just don't believe that it's a feeling um I, there was a, a story that i listened to Shh, go away go away there was a story that i listened to um of a couple and he was saying for a year, he ended up marrying this woman, but for years, for five years, he pushed her off even courting. He pushed her off courting or even being his girlfriend because he said when he talked to her, everything about her, he did not get a, they dated for a second, but he let it go and would not go further with her because he did not get what he um, explained as a euphoric feeling. Like he didn't get that bubble guts and stuff like that even though she did everything in her power to take care of him and show him love even though she was loyal and she put herself on the back burner to make sure he was good he felt like the way that he learned love was always supposed to be this major feeling and he said you know fast forward five years down the line he ended up they end up just being able to be friends then they end up going to counseling because maybe they wanted to try um courting and the pastor explaining to him all the things that she done for him is love. And if he wait on the feeling, he never going to find that in nobody. And he said, and he courted with her for years until the day he proposed to her, which is the day he got that bubble gut in his feeling. He said a feeling he never felt ever in his life. And he knew that was the one for him because he bust out crying and all this other stuff. But I was just sad to say, we put too much emphasis on the feeling versus the action. And that's why I was separating. I know that was long and drawn out, and I apologize, but I just wanted to expound. Excellent. Shaul or Zebulon? Oh, I forgot you said she was going last. Um, I think Shamika made a, a great point. I mean, everybody made great points today, you know. So I, I want to, uh, I want to give everybody their, um. They're just do for that. Um, but one thing I, I, I would say is this. Um, you need you 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 need to eat to live, right? So um or or you need food to you need you need food, you know, but you know, besides the um the fasting state, you know, whenever a person decides to do that. But you basically you need to eat, you know what I'm saying, to drink water to basically live. Cause you have, you know, different nutrients and vitamins and minerals that help your body be in, you know, that you know, keep your body in tip top production and shape. And so when you're talking about relationships and love and things like that, it's the same thing. 
No, I don't believe love is a feeling either. It is definitely an action. However, you get satisfaction from the experience of love. And so just like when you eat, you satisfy, you, you feel a certain sense of satisfaction from hunger. So when you're longing for love or you want love or you have love in your relationship, and I'm talking about true love, you know what I'm saying? Um, you experience a feeling. You experience a sense of satisfaction from that moment. You know what I'm saying? And it's going to happen just like when you're in a relationship, you're going to experience a sense of anger sometimes, sadness sometimes. These are all emotions that are fleeting. They're not long-lasting at all. However, you know what I'm saying? The relationship it, you guys are, that, that you guys are building is built on the fact that you're, um, you're preparing yourselves for that sense of satisfaction in a good way in a relationship for the rest of your lives. You know what I'm saying? That's what you guys are doing. And, you know, I always talk about, you know, with life, how, how you know, how I look at life is like an ocean for a man, you know? A man who was born and, you know, born on the island and his father, when it was time for him to leave, shipped him out into the big ocean. And it was this man's job to journey, you know what I'm saying, until he found what he was looking for so he can start it all over again and ship his son off into the big ocean. And basically what I mean by that is that a man go, a man would sail and stop at different islands and different places to learn all that he could to do all that he could, to gain all that he could, so that he could be prepared to give that which his father gave him. And so I said that to say that in a society like this, these conversations is they they stem from a level of extreme unpreparedness, unknowing, and pain and struggle, like I mentioned earlier. And I want to say this, we all have the ability to understand these things and love properly without an example. Just like nobody ever had to tell you that it was wrong to kill somebody. For some reason, you just knew that already. So I want people to stop making excuses for having to need an example to get themselves together. And this is the last point I'm going to make, because I was mentioning this and I talked to Tamar the other day about people bull crapping their show because that's what we do. We we have these conversations and they sound good and we talk good and we, we do all these things. But we sit here a lot of ourselves every day about what we think we want, but not willing to admit that we really don't want that or not in a position to really want it truly at the moment. So that goes back to some of the other episodes I've seen you guys talk about self-sabotage, you know, uh, healing, and, and a lot of these other things. And the problem is, because I, like, to be honest with you, two-parent household or not, like, I grew up with two parents, but my parents didn't know everything, man. I'm not saying what I'm saying now because I was taught all this. I, what I am saying is that if you really want something, you're going to go get it, you know, because, you know, people only make excuses when it's a few things involved, fear, you don't want to do it, laziness, or whatever the case is. But you know doggone well when a person really want to change and do something right and do the right thing, they're not going to let nothing stop them from doing it. They A lot of people even die trying to do it. So let's cut the crap and let's start being honest. The first person you need to be honest with is yourself. You know what I'm saying? What is your problem with with love? Why why are you experiencing the things that you're experiencing while you're not experiencing what you think is true love? What are you doing? I mean, can you really point the finger at someone else? Should you point the finger at yourself? Who are you? Are you inadequate? Who are you? 
So at the end of the day, it, these things are fairly simple if sought out and truly to be understand with an extreme thirst for it. Because a lot of the times when we make comments, and I'm making this general because I'm not I, I, I'm not attempting to try to call anyone in particular out. I've seen and heard a lot of people do and say things like this. But we make comments and we talk about these things from a sense of what we want. You know what I'm saying? It's not about what you want. It's about what you're willing to accept. And life was already fixed. So the problem, you, the problem, your problem is, is that you're not accepting what life only has for you. And you want something else. And you don't want to admit there's something wrong with you and that you really haven't found what you're looking for because you're not willing to accept what life was already created to give you. It's not difficult to understand at all. That's why I was saying the day that I stopped making everything complex and stop making everything about my show and start realizing that, to be honest with you, when you look in the scriptures and you look at all these different leaders and prophets and things like this, it's one thing that they all had in common. Was loyalty. That was one to the most high. And I'm talking about the, the ones who did it to the very end. And then the last one was sacrifice. They sacrificed for everybody. They understood. They understood it. You know what I'm saying? I mean, Moses didn't have to plead for the children of Israel. Hey, man, don't don't destroy him. I, you know, you could destroy me, don't destroy them. You know what I'm saying? I mean, this whole life, I mean, what which we all we always say all the time, it's about going to the kingdom, right? How you gonna get to the kingdom without sacrifice? That's what you want so bad. But the problem is you really don't want to admit that you don't care about nobody but yourself. You are really selfish as a person. In a society like this, this is a Kali Ma, Alistair Crowley society, do what thou wilt society. It's do whatever the hell you want to do whenever you feel like doing it. And the mask that you wear is an Israelite mask. It's a Bible mask. But you're still doing what the hell you want to do. You're still doing it. And when we had these conversations, it, it, we talk and it sound good. But when you leave, you go right back to doing what you've been doing putting that mask on, when you go to Walmart, you go shopping, you go out with your family, you put that mask right back on and pretend like you want what's right, and you really don't. So at the end of the day, I'm going to end this off with, at the end of the day, I'm going to end this off with, are you the problem for why we even having these conversations? Why haven't you experienced what you say you long for and want so much? Why? You should ask yourself that. What's wrong with you? I mean, are you are you perfect? Are you flawless? I mean, I haven't met a person that would admit that they were. So if you know that you're not, then what have, have you done? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> what, have, what have you done? So and that's it. I'm a you right there. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, how do I follow that up? Uh, you don't. You don't. Yeah, you don't. <laughs> yeah, that that's that's that that's what's up. Um, all of that. Not really much to say, but but it's interesting that 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 um. Uh, that Shaul he, he he mentioned um uh he mentioned the issue about wearing a, wearing the mask and there's a book that I've re that I've recommended um that everybody um you know touch on or whatever like that because it deals with the psych psychological part of it I was just having this conversation um yesterday evening uh I got introduced um uh, an old friend of mine he is uh his sister um has kind of like, you know, she just walked into the uh, the covenant per se. Um, and we were just all having just a general uh, conversation um, about it. And he was one of the first people who I ever recommended that book, uh, Who Am I This Time? Uncovering the Fictive Personality. He was like the first, when I read it, he was the first brother who I said, yo, 
you need to read this. And he ended up sharing it with his whole family over the years. So, but we were talking about the necessity of wearing masks. Why do people do these things? Like Shaw was just saying, like, you know, like, you know, why are we doing? And the reason being is because, th th you know, these masks has served as sort of like a blanket, sort of like how, you know, in Charlie Brown, Linus and his blanket, it's, you know what I'm saying? It's a blanket. It's a, you know, it, it's a form of comfort because most of us have lived our lives in this weird twilight zone kind of place where the world can be fashioned, the, the, the entire world can be fashioned by our own, our own thoughts. The very things that we think, we can form this little world that we live in, you know, the, 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 the secret world of me or whatever. And in that world, you know, we are the only ones who haven't done anybody wrong. Everybody else is full of crap. Everybody else is, you know, um, you know, piece of this and she's a damn this and so on and so forth. But we're the only ones who are, uh, um, who haven't been tainted by um, the, the madness that surrounds us. But it's only because it's a fiction of our own making. And the mask helps us to cope with that fact. It protects us from the reality. The reality is that once the mask is taken off and you put that person out into the world, they look around and they say, oh, wait a minute. I'm also out of my damn mind. I, I just sat here and manufactured a world that actually doesn't exist. And I manufactured it to protect me from a world that I would otherwise perish in because I have not been prepared for this, uh, for this world. I haven't been prepared for love. I haven't been prepared for relationships. I haven't been prepared for friendships. I haven't been prepared for anything. So rather than have to face the daunting task of, lear of relearning these things, and a lot of times we are relearning these things in our adulthood, that's a very difficult lesson. It's easy to learn when you're, when you're, when you're 10. It's easy to learn when you're 15. But when you're 50, it's kind of, it, it, it's, it's, it seems like it's a wrap. So it's much easier to wear the mask and pretend that it's everybody else as opposed to saying, no, I've just been living in a damn, an illusionary world and I need to, I need to be relearned. I need to be retaught because I'm the one that's out of my damn mind. It's not everybody. I always use the, I always use the, um, what I can refer to as the Halle Berry syndrome. Okay, you know, it's, it's, it's the Holly Berry syndrome. It's like after a while, it, it, you know, listen, 10, 15 dudes under your belt, Holly, it can't be just them. It, 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 it has to be you, <laughs> whatever. And I think that when we understand that, that there is a possibility that we might be the reason uh, why we haven't been able to experience love the way we desired or whatever and because we've manufactured these images of love that have shielded us from having to do the work in cultivating real love. So we, we take on these fictitious concepts of love. That, like the sister Shamika said, the idea that love, you know, the feeling, like, oh, if it's not a feeling, because feelings are just like anything else. Feelings, they're fleeting. Like right now, I'm hungry. If I go eat something, I'm no longer hungry. Just that quick, I've changed the dynamic of my mind. Just that quick. Those are not lasting concepts. Those are very dangerous things because that means that you are now subject to fleeting pieces of energy. It's like people who get, you know, who get riled up sexually, whatever like that, they run out and go buck wild. And then one day look up and say, oh, wow, I have AIDS. Oh, damn, that, that's messed up. Or Oh man, I got this woman pregnant. Oh, she's pregnant. She's pregnant. She's pregnant. I got children all over the place. How did that happen? Why? Because we were moving in our emotions. We were moving in that feeling. But all of these things are, you know what I'm saying? All of these things are psychological issues. These are, you know what I'm saying? These are, these are childhood traumas. You know, uh, you know, even when we see good examples, a lot of times we convince ourselves that these good examples are not enough. Or sometimes we convince ourselves that we're not, we're not good enough for it. We're not good enough for love, you know, um, whatever that love might be. I'm not good enough for it. 
Um, these are the, these are issues that have to be worked out. But again, it's much easier to say it, it's much easier to pretend that it's everybody else than to say, nah, it's me. I'm just I'm just full of crap. I I, I need to get my head together. I need to get my dome piece you know, screwed on straight. And I need to sit down, sit up under some type of leadership. Just somebody, please give me some direction because I have not done a good job in following direction. Um, you know, these are lessons, these are hard lessons to learn. Um, I know from per firsthand experience, they are hard lessons. Uh, you know, because now you have to, because now you have to admit that you have been a victim or you, you've, you've been a self victim. You become a self victim of, um, self-fulfilling prophecy. You create the scenarios that bring forth the desired end that you, you know what I'm saying, that you wanted. But you've created it. You're the one who's creating the scenario. So when you create the scenario and something occurs, you say, oh, see, this is the proof that it happened because it, but it's like, no, but this is all happening inside of your head. And I learned that early on that, oh, wait a minute, I'm over here creating fictitious, fictitious life, you know, lives and concepts or whatever to protect me from the work that needed to be done on, you know, early on. And so I had to do it. And I know a lot of people who had to do it as well. Um, you know, it's a lot of work, but it's a rewarding work because at least you, at least you're able to stop lying to yourself. Um, I got tired of lying to myself. People get tired of lying because lies takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of work to, re to remember a bunch of nonsense, but it's much easier to learn to just to know the truth, to remember the truth, because it's very simple. And so that's the type of work that we have to do. We have to work to flush these things out of our, out of our minds, flush it out and start fresh. Otherwise, we'll be making the same complaints at 50, making the same complaints at 60. We'll be on, we'll be on Facebook at 70 years old talking about still looking for a wife. Like, yeah, I do. Nah, you're finished. You're washed up. Nah, sister, you're washed up. Menopause is 30 years past your prime. You're washed up. It's over. We don't want to get to that point. We want to get to a point where we can say, no, I know what I want. I know what I need. And I'm going to pursue it the right way. And I'm going to accomplish it. It's going to go down. And it's going to go down the right way. Not the way I want it to go down, but the, the way that is right for me. The way that is right for the next person. And with that. I mean, God dang, Zeppelin, that was pretty much, <laughs> that's pretty much, I, I, put, I put my, put my notebook away. I definitely, I definitely agree. I think it's okay to, um, to sit and reflect. So I agree about, you know, the things that, the situations we've been in are our fault. You know what I'm saying? Even if it's just in you choosing somebody that wasn't for you. You know what I'm saying? So I definitely agree. I think sitting still is key. Um, and that, um, you know, telling yourself the truth is, also key you know what i'm saying moving like that and not moving sometimes it's cool not to move you just sit still and be like i'm over here on my permanent um relationship vacation so anyway so next week's most high willing the topic is uh and i'm gonna have to I'm, looking at I'm sorry next week the topic is uh mediocrity and it's um me it's not a word but it's it's like media I misspelled it on purpose, but it's, me it's mediocrity, how art imitates life. So we'll be talking a lot about the messages we get through the media and all different forms and how that, how that impacts um, our relationships. So until next time, y'all have a good day. Peace, peace. Bye. Peace. <laughs>